In chapters 2 and 3, we consider important truths concerning the law, the dual witness in man of reason and conscience, every man standing guilty before God and God's provision of justification freely by grace through faith. We also look at common objections to the judgment of God that Paul addresses. All right, if you have your Bibles, uh, please turn with me to Ro the book of Romans. You can pause there in Romans chapter 1. So, over these two months, June and July, we are journeying through the book of Romans chapter by chapter and uh, doing our study, receiving insights, learning uh, from Paul's epistle to the church at Rome, the believers at Rome. Uh, what I encourage you to do, if you can, is to download the sermon notes or read or look, the, look at the sermon notes. They go up on our church website, usually on Saturday uh, same thing, it's accessible on your church app. So you can actually get the whole message before you come. <laughs> uh, one advantage of that is when you listen, it, the whole thing is reinforced. You know, last Sunday, I was at West, and um, one of the people there came to me and said, Asa, I, I always read the sermon notes before I come to church. So that when I hear, listen to you, I can really understand, you know, and take. And I was really impressed that she was, uh, you know, making the effort to do that. So I encourage you to do that. And if you have it. Yeah, the, phone, uh, the church app on your phone, you're welcome to use your phone in church as long as you don't answer calls. But you can look at the notes and follow along. Uh, and especially as you're studying through Romans because there's a lot more in the notes than what we can communicate uh, in this 45 minutes uh, service time. Uh, so I'd encourage you to read those notes. And also um, we uh, use it in our life group. So when you, if you're part of a life group, you get together others to study the word. Uh, uh, you, know, you can discuss a lot more uh, as you use the notes there. So... It's just a little encouragement. I want to quickly review what we did last Sunday as we began Romans, starting to this um, Paul's episode of Romans. And today our goal is to cover, chap to cover chapters 2 and 3. That's our goal this morning. So let's quickly review. Paul's epistle to the church in Rome was written about AD 57 when he was on a second missionary journey, uh, sorry, when, when he was going through his third missionary journey, uh, he was traveling through Corinth. So from Corinth, he wrote to the believers at Rome. Now, how did the church in Rome start? Very quickly, uh, we don't have a, a, a record of an individual founder, somebody who went and uh, started the church in Rome, but this is how it most likely took place. What we read in Acts chapter 2 is that on the day of Pentecost, uh, this was about eighty thirty. There were people, visitors from Rome, Acts 2 verse 10. There were visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. That's mean uh, Gentile converts to so Judaism. They were there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. So they were most likely impacted that, that day, received Jesus Christ. And during that time, uh, were discipled under the apostles and then would have journeyed back to Rome. So that's how the church in Rome most likely got started. There's no individual founder there. They were, these were believers who were impacted uh, by the, uh, on the day of Pentecost. So Paul is writing to the believers at Rome. Keep in mind some, some things. First of all is that the church in Rome is a mixed group of both Jews and Gentile believers. That means people who've come to believe in Jesus Christ, some of them have been some of them come, have come from a Jewish background. Some of them have come from a Gentile background, non-Jewish background. They are believers. They comprise this church in Rome. And so Paul is writing to them. And what we said is that Paul's epistle to, Ro to, the, Romes, Roman, to the Romans is one of his highest or his best works uh, doctrinally. He, he expounds or explains, describes the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, in great depth, in great detail. So, Romans chapter 1, the main point there in Romans chapter 1, after all the introduction, hello, and, and all of that, is that Paul gets into the fact that God, as creator, has revealed himself to, his cre to, his, to people through his creation. So, the invisible attributes of God are revealed in his creation, so that nobody is without excuse. Nobody can say, I didn't know there was a God. Because God has revealed himself to us through his creation. So no one can say, I didn't know there was a God. Because the invisible attributes of God are revealed to us in his creation. Other thing I want to point out, which I did not say last Sunday, was the importance of verse 17. 
Romans 1 verse 17 says that in the gospel, in it, the righteousness of God was revealed from faith to faith. Uh, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. This word, this verse affected a man named Martin Luther. This was the starting point, if you will, of the whole Reformation. So, you know, this, uh, this was a time when, uh, uh, when Martin Luther was studying and meditating the scriptures and this verse hit him. The verse says... The just, and this was, you know, um, that, that same verse can also be translated as the just by faith shall live. That means you become just by faith and you live. So that verse hit him. The Bible is saying that we become just or we become righteous by faith. Not by works, not by paying money to the church, not by, you know, all these other things. But we become just by faith. So this was a starting point. And his, his understanding of that was reinforced as he next he studied the book of Galatians. So these were two foundational things in Martin Luther's life. There's Romans 1.17 and the entirety of the book of Galatians that gave birth really to the whole Reformation. Uh, uh, enabling people to understand that we are saved by grace through faith. So that's, that's Romans 1. Let's pick up in Romans chapter 2. We're going to do Romans 2 and Romans 3. Now... Uh, as we begin to read Romans 2, what is Paul trying to get at? And I want us to understand that when Paul wrote this letter, he did not write in chapter and verse. Right? So he didn't pause in chapter 1 and, you know, I'll come back later. No, it was one long letter. Just that when you and I read it, uh, we, and for our understanding or for our use, it's been broken down in chapter and verse so that we could uh, interact around it. But he wrote it as one long letter, which means that any thought given in what we call as chapter 1 is something that he will explain further in, 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 in what, he's, what he's writing further on. So in, in one sense, we actually have to have a backward look. That means you need to understand what else he has said about this. In chapters to come, because he's building up to something. He's leading up to something. Are you with me? Right? So, when we read chapter 2, don't read it in isolation. Read it as something he's working towards in chapters 3 and then further on. In chapter 2, Paul is addressing the Jewish people. And he's addressing a, a, a problem with their attitude or in, in their understanding. The Jews feel that they are better than the Gentiles. Because they have been given two things. They've been given the law and they've been given circumcision. So he's addressing this particular issue in chapter 2. So let's read Romans chapter 2 and then we'll come back and, and just summarize that for us. Romans chapter 2, we're going to read the whole chapter. Verse 1. Therefore you, Jews, therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are, who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just, are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although ha not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. 
in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keep the righteous requirements of the law, which will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you? Who even your written code, even with your written code and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So let's try to summarize Romans chapter 2. And I want to uh, uh, not necessarily go through this verse by verse, but bring out the main things he's saying here, Romans 2. What is Paul saying? First of all, he is challenging the attitude of the Jews towards the Gentiles. The Jews say, we have the law, we have circumcision as a sign of our covenant with God. So we are a privileged people. And we can teach other people the law. We can tell them what is right and wrong because we've been given the law. But he challenges their attitude. He says, look, you who know how to tell someone else what is right and wrong, you don't keep the law yourself. You who tell somebody else, don't steal, you're stealing. You're saying don't commit a murder, you're committing murder yourself. Don't you think you will also be judged? So the first thing he, so in addressing the Jews in this whole thing, here's what he challenges them with. He's challenging the attitude of the Jews. Uh, he says, you know, judging others requires that I must hold myself accountable. Then he says, if you judge others, don't think that you will escape God's judgment yourself. This is Romans chapter 2, verse 3. And then verse 4, he's saying, look, it is the goodness of God that actually brings somebody to repentance. You're not going to bring people into repentance by condemning them. You're going to bring them to repentance by the goodness of God. Are you with me so far? Right? So he's addressing their attitude uh, towards the Gentiles, the Jews. And then he tells them, look, you know, God's judgment is without partiality both to the Jews and the Gentiles. He's telling them that uh, if those who have the law, God will judge them according to the law. But those who do not have the law, God has a way to judge them. And he explains that further. So the first thing you find here in, this, in Romans 2 is he's dealing with the attitude of the Jews towards the Gentiles. And he challenges the Jews that, look, even though you've got the law, you're not keeping the law. The next thing he shares is he presents an understanding of God's judgment. How does God judge? What does he do judge? And when does he do it? Right? And I'll summarize that here. How does God judge? When does he judge? And what, uh, uh, what does he judge? And when does he judge? How does God judge? You'll see the summary here. Romans 2 verse 2. God always judges according to truth. Romans 2 5. God executes righteous judgment. Romans 2.11, God judges without partiality. And Romans 2.16, he judges according to the gospel. So how does God judge? Four things Paul points out. First, he judges according to truth. That means it's the word of God. Thy word is truth. Second, God judges righteously. He's a righteous judge. Third, God Judges, Romans 2.11, without partiality. And fourth, 
God judges according to the gospel. So all of us, whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile, this is how you're going to be judged. Are you with me? This is how it's going to be. So now some people say, you know, what about those who don't hear the gospel? How will they be judged if they have never heard the gospel? How will they be judged? Well, the only answer we can give is this is how God will judge all people. He will judge with truth. That is according to his word. He will judge righteously. He will judge without partiality. And he will judge according to the gospel. That's the only thing we can say. Because some people say, well, you know, if people have not heard the gospel, God will have, you know, they come up with all kinds of other theories. But all these other theories are baseless. That means they don't have scripture to back them up. So that is mere speculation. The only thing we can say is Paul said, God will judge the whole world, all people, by these four things. Next, what does God judge in our lives? What's he looking for? Paul highlights three things that God is looking for. He judges our deeds. This is in uh, Romans chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. Again and again and again, he says, God will judge our deeds. He who works righteousness, he who does what is right, he judges our deeds. Second, God judges what we seek after. This is Romans 2, 7. Those who seek after glory and honor and immortality. That means they are seeking the right things. The word then the Greek for seek can also be translated desire. So God judges what we desire. Third, he judges the secrets of our heart. That means he judges the motives of our hearts. So if God was going to judge us, what are, what are the three things he will judge? Our deeds, our desires, and our motives. Our deeds, our desires, our motives. He's going to judge that. The point Paul wants to emphasize is whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile, all of of us fail God's (laughs) CET. Can't make it. Our deeds, whether you're Jew or Gentile, sorry, we don't make it. Our desires, is there anybody who's Pure in their desires. Who's seeking after righteousness, honor, and glory, and immortality. Fail. Jew, Gentile. Motives. Whose are motives are pure? Whether you're Jew, whether you're Gentile, we fail. That's the point. Are you with me? If there was some person who was perfect in their deeds, perfect in their desires, perfect in their motives, then God can give them eternal life. But there's nobody, Jew or Gentile. We all fail. What God is judging. Are you with me? And then he says, God, when does God judge? He has a day. This is, he mentions this twice there in uh, Romans 2, verse 5, the day of wrath. Or Romans 2, 16, the day when God will judge. So how does God judge? He judges according to truth. He judges according to righteousness. He judges, according, he judges without partiality. And he judges according to the gospel. What does God judge? He looks at our deeds, our desires, and our motives. And unfortunately, we all fail. Right? Now, interestingly, as Paul is progressing in Romans 2, he reveals the work of the conscience. So some may say, hey, we Jews, we have the law, but what about the Gentiles? They don't have the law. So how can they know what is right and wrong? So how can God judge their deeds because they don't have the Law. Then Paul says, for those who are without the law, God will also judge them without the law. That means he won't won't take the law and judge them without that. But he says, every person has a law working in himself. This is Romans 2 verse 15. Their conscience also bearing them witness. So the conscience in every man is the working of the law in every person. That means even though a person doesn't know the law, that is as the written code as given to the Jewish people, every person has a conscience. Within the person, there is something that says what is right and what is wrong. So nobody is without excuse. Nobody can say, God, I didn't know what's right and wrong. 
God says, there is a working of the law inside you. There is like a judiciary system inside every man. Teaching that person what's right and what's wrong. And you know what is right and wrong. And so even if you wanted to have your deeds evaluated, there's a conscience that tells you right and wrong. Your deeds will be evaluated according to that. But we still fail. Are you with me? So the conscience working in every person. Now, I want to address an issue here, which, which again, uh, sometimes people, uh, I, I think it's an incorrect statement people make, which is that uh, people say this, that for those who have never heard the gospel, they will be judged according to the conscience. That is not what Paul is saying. That's a wrong statement. Romans 2.15 is not contrasting the law uh, uh, the gospel and conscience, he's contrasting the law and conscience. Are you with me? That those who do not have the law, they have the working of the law inside them, which is their conscience. So the conscience is not a substitute for the gospel. People still need the gospel. Because in the very next verse, in Romans 2 verse 16, he says, God will reveal the secrets of men's hearts and will judge them according to my gospel. Are you with me? So the conscience is the working of the law. It's not a substitute for the gospel. People still need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And people will still be judged according to the gospel. You with me so far? Yes or no? Yeah. Okay. So here's what I want to say. If you look at Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 2, there are two built-in indicators in every human being pointing them to God and teaching them what is righteousness. In Romans chapter 1, he talks about reason. Romans chapter 2, he talks about conscience. That means in every individual, there is these two built-in indicators. It's like every person is born with this. Reason and conscience. Reason gives every human being the ability to look at creation and logically come to a conclusion that there has to be a great creator who created everything. Conscience gives every person the ability to say, this is right and this is wrong. So in every human person, God has placed reason and conscience. It is something higher and beyond any other creature. You don't find the dog lifting up its front paws and saying, oh God, I see you in your creation. No. They have a certain amount of reason, ability to think and so on, but they not, don't have the ability to recognize God in his creation. That's only given to man. The ability to see the creator in creation. Conscience. Two things. Unfortunately, both these indicators can be degraded or become corrupted. The reason, as Paul explains in Romans chapter 1, becomes blinded. And man refuses to recognize God for who he is, to glorify him for who he is, and to be thankful to him for who he is. Why? Because the reason has been darkened, corrupted. Conscience becomes corrupted. The conscience becomes seared, as Paul talks about in other, other epistles. That our conscience comes to a place where it no longer functions. In fact, it works the reverse. And it says what is good is, what is bad is good. It's a defiled conscience. And unfortunately, in our world system, this happens probably by the time they reach grade six. <laughs> that even day before they became, become teenagers... The reason gets corrupted, they're darkened, and they're unwilling to recognize God in his creation. And conscience can get so defiled that even little children can begin to call right as, or, I mean, wrong as right in the other way. Are you understand? But within every person, there is these two things, reason and conscience, pointing them to God and showing them what is right and wrong. So, the end of chapter 2, basically, Paul says, look, Jews, you're without an excuse, but this is who, who a true Jew is. Romans 2, verse 20 and 29, he says, a true Jew is not somebody who, who, who boasts of the law or boasts of his circumcision. A true Jew is somebody who's got a change of heart. 
that's a true Jew. He's setting them up for what he's going to tell them in chapter 3. Are you with me so far? Okay, let's read chapter 3 and we will summarize it in a similar manner. Let's read the entirety of chapter 3. What advantage then has the Jew? Or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. So Paul uses this phrase, certainly not, very often in uh, his epistle, 10 times in his epistle to the Romans, and I took two, two, two or three times outside of it. The word uh, certainly not means just don't even think about it. So don't even think about it, right? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. Verse 6, certainly not. For then how will God judge the world? For if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, why am I still judged as a sinner? And why not say so? Or why not say, let us do evil that good may come, as, as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say their condemnation is just. Verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is no, none who understands, there is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside, they have, be, be, they have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb, with their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps, asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what, whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now... The righteousness of the law, or righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of one who has faith in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what? Law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. So what is he saying in chapter 3? In verses 1 and 2, Paul tells the Jews, hey, I'm, I know I'm hitting you really hard on the head. Don't get discouraged. There is something good, right? So he says, you know, what does it profit then uh, to, uh, to, be, uh, to be a Jew or to be circumcised? He says, you know, here is the benefit or the blessing of being a Jew. To you were committed the oracles of God. That means God used the Jewish people to bring forth the law. And he, that's their benefit. And I will explain uh, that once again at the end of the chapter. But this chapter, for Paul, we can break it up into four sections. One is Paul asks some rhetorical questions that uh, raise certain objects that are, of objections that have been raised. And it's very interesting to go through that. Then he gets to his main conclusion. We've all sinned. Then he presents the most important part, verses 21 to 26, that we've been justified by faith. And that's the key. 
He's been building up to that all along. And then he closes off this chapter with again a few rhetorical questions. Now when I say he, uh, Paul didn't write in chapter and verse, but the way this chapter has been put together, that's how it is. All right. So let's look at the rhetorical questions here that Paul asks. The first is, hey, to the Jews have been given the oracles of God, but what if some don't believe? That means God has given the word, but some people don't believe. What happens if people don't believe? He says, see, even if anybody refuses to believe, that does not change God. If you don't believe, it does not make the faithfulness of God any different. And let every man, let God be true and every man a liar. In other words, if you don't believe, it doesn't change God. Next rhetorical question that Paul addresses is this. Is God unjust who inflicts wrath when he gets glory of our sin? This is verses 5 to 7. So the argument goes like this. Hey, I sin, but it, my sin makes God look good. It amplifies his righteousness. And the truth of God is advanced through my lie. So why is God punishing me? He's being unjust. And the best person to have this argument would be Judas. He would say something like this. Lord, if I had not betrayed Jesus, Jesus would not have died on the cross. And the world would not be saved. So why are you sending me to hell? Argument. God is unjust. For punishing us for our sin when he actually is glorified through our sin. I mean, he's made to look so righteous because I am unrighteous. And his truth is advancing through my lie. You know, how would God respond to Judas? Lord, if I had not betrayed Jesus, Jesus would not have been crucified, the world would not have been saved. How would God respond? So, Judas, on three counts, you failed. Your deeds, your desires, and your motives. I judge according to deeds, desires, and what you did was wrong. You betrayed. Your desire was for 30 pieces of silver. Judas, don't, don't, don't fake that. You wanted 30 pieces of? That's why you did it. Not to glorify God. Your desire was wrong. Your motive. Let's get rid of this man. I'll join with the others. You failed. Now Judas, in spite of your sin, I turned it around. I made something good come out of it that does not absolve you of your wrongdoing. Just because I made something good come out of your wrongdoing does not make your wrongdoing right. You're still a sinner in word in, in, in deed, in desire, and in your motives. So that's what Paul is saying. See, people can argue. Is God unjust that he's punishing me for my sin when my sin makes him actually look really good? Hey, he says, how will God judge the world? He's going to judge according to truth. He's going to judge in righteousness. He's going to judge without partiality. He'll judge according to the gospel. All counts, we fail. The next rhetorical question that Paul addresses in that chapter is... Romans 3.8, he says, hey, some may say, oh, Paul is preaching about the goodness of God, about faith. So let us do evil that good may come. Paul doesn't even bother addressing that question. He says, some people are slanderously telling that we are preaching that. We're not preaching that. No, he says, we are slanderously reported. So some people are accusing Paul. Paul is saying, let us, you know, do evil. Evil so that good can come. Paul is saying, that's not what I am preaching. That's slander. And in all Paul says is, their condemnation is just. That means they're going to get what they deserve. Moves on. He doesn't even answer that. And the next one question, uh, next question, Romans 3, 9, rhetorical question is, are Jews better than Gentiles? 
Obviously not, because he says, we have charged that both Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. We all sinned. So he addresses those common objections that would be raised. Then in verses 10 to 20, he just basically says, look, there is no one who is righteous. All have sinned. And he quotes from the Old Testament scripture. Basically saying that the whole world stands guilty before God. Romans 3 verse 19. And in Romans 3 20 that no flesh will be justified by their deeds. So remember Paul has been building up to this. Basically he's saying we all stand condemned before God. But now he's going to present the good news. That is verse 21 to 26. So if you've been sleeping through the rest of this, it's time to wake up. Don't miss this. Verses 21 to 26. So all that he's been saying in chapter 1 and chapter 2 is to bring us to this point. It says, but the righteousness of God which comes without the law. That means without you trying to keep the deeds. I mean, without you on the, not on the basis of your works. The righteousness of God, which comes without the law, is revealed. God is made known. What is the gospel? He says, Romans 1, 17, he said, For in it, that is in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Now he's unveiling that for us. The gospel reveals this. What is it? The righteousness of God without the law is given to man simply through faith in Jesus Christ. And he says there in verse 24, that being justified freely by his grace. Now, I want us to understand something in the Greek. In the Greek, or let me say this in English. In English, we the word righteous and just could mean different things. Righteous means somebody is holy. Just is, you know, when we talk about just, we talk about justice. Being equi uh, equity, fairness. So we kind of draw the distinction in English. But in Greek, the word just, justified, justly, justification, righteous, righteousness, righteously, they all come from the same root word and they mean the same thing. It simply means to be right before God. To be right. And it is used in terms of relationship with God. It also is used in terms of doing what is right before God. So what is Paul saying? Verse 24, being justified, being made righteous, that is being made Acceptable and approved in God's eyes. Being justified freely by His grace. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So what happens now? He's saying, look, we're all miserable sinners. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, you can't keep the law. You can't live by your conscience. We've all failed. Um, and then he says, you know what? Here's the good news. The righteousness of God is given to everyone. Who has faith in Jesus Christ. So when we say righteousness of God. What are we saying? We are saying God has acquitted you. God has declared you righteous. That to be righteous in God's eyes. It simply means to be made as if you have never sinned. Let it sink in. So let's say it together. I have been made just as if I'd never sinned. That's righteous. To be made just as if I had never sinned. And all this is of God. Meaning God does the whole thing for us. Simply by faith in Jesus all that I do, all that you do as a believer is to have faith in Jesus. And we are justified freely by His grace through faith in Jesus Christ. I mean, God says, I am making you, I am declaring you somebody who's just as if you had never sinned. That is being made righteous. He's saying the righteousness of God... Verse 22, 
the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. To all and on all who believe. You believe, you are the righteousness of God. You've been made just as if you had never sinned. You are accepted, approved 100% in the eyes of God. How could God do it? Because of the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Verse 25. Whom God set forth. God put this out there. God set him out as a propitiation, as an atoning sacrifice. It's referring to the mercy seat, the place where the high priest would shed his blood so that God would, would forgive the sins of the people. Jesus became that atoning sacrifice for us. And he says there in verse 26, that God could demonstrate his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That means the same judge... Found you guilty, punished your sins, and then declared you just as if you never sinned. The same judge. That he might be just and the justifier of him who has faith in Jesus. God is the justifier. God is the one who makes you just as if you had never sinned. And he could do that. Because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. This is what Paul has been building up from chapter 1 verse 18. He's been building up to this truth. As a believer, you have been declared righteous through your faith in Jesus Christ. And that begins our spiritual journey. It starts by faith in Jesus and receiving the righteousness of God. So today, when you worship God, you don't worship God as, Lord, I'm such a sinner. God dealt with that. You worship God as a person who is just as if you had never sinned. And this is something God has given you. He's put it on your life. On all and to all who believe. And then he closes off this chapter by again asking a few rhetorical questions. I'll just quickly mention it and close where is boasting then? So he says, okay, can anybody boast? No. Because God does this for us. Nobody can say I kept the law. Nobody can say I had a perfect conscience and I lived by my conscience. Nobody can boast. Where is boasting then? No boasting. Second question he asks, is he the God of the Jews only? No. He's God of Jews and Gentiles. He's welcoming everyone. And... Everyone, Jew and Gentile, gets saved the same way. Again, there is a teaching that goes on around that uh, God has a different way of salvation for Jewish people. That is not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying whether you're circumcised or whether you're uncircumcised, we all get saved the same way through faith in Jesus Christ. Same way. Only one way of salvation through faith in Jesus. So I want to make that point there. And then, then last question he asks in verse 31. Do we make the void the law? I mean, then is the law useless? No, no, no. We establish the law. The law has served its purpose. It's pointed us to our sinfulness, that we are totally sinful, incapable of saving us, and then it points us to Jesus Christ. So the law has served its purpose. And when we come to faith, we establish the law. We say, law, you've done your job. I've come to faith in Jesus Christ. So the purpose of the law was to expose our sin and point us to Jesus. So when we have faith, we are not saying the law is useless. We are saying we have established the law. Law has served its purpose in pointing us to Jesus Christ. Amen? So one takeaway. You have been made just as if you have never said. Simply by grace through faith. In Jesus Christ, who became our redemption, who became the atoning sacrifice. Amen. Let's rise to our feet. Only take a moment, please, just to say, God, thank you. I could have never kept the law. I could have never... 
you know, my conscience, I don't know where it is, but, you know, none of us could have succeeded if we were to be judged according to our deeds, our desires, and our motives. But thank God today, by faith in Christ, we have received a free gift. Free gift, righteousness. Just thank Him for it. God, I accept it. I know I could never have done this on my own. But as a free gift, you've given righteousness to me. You've made me a person just as if I never sinned. I accept it. Father, we pray that our hearts will be opened to know that we have received righteousness given to us as a gift. We are righteous, acceptable and approved in the eyes of God, 100%. You've declared us as people just as if we'd never sinned. We are righteous in your eyes. Before we close this morning, if there's anyone here, you're not sure that if you have actually believed in Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your Savior, to receive this thing that we're talking, talking about. Maybe you've attended church and maybe you've come in and out, but if you are not sure that you have received this personally, I want to help you do that. Just pray with, with you a simple prayer. And this morning, you can leave this place knowing for sure that you've received this free gift that we were talking about. Just pray this with me. If you've never done this before, if you're not sure. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. But I thank you that you died for my sins. That you rose up again. That you're alive today. That you can forgive my sins and make me righteous. Freely by grace. So I receive this. Make me a child of God. Help me to follow you the rest of my life. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody, you pray this prayer with me for the very first time. may want to celebrate with you. So if you don't mind, raise your hand up, please, wherever you are. If you pray this prayer with me for the very first time this morning, receiving God's forgiveness, receiving God's grace. I can't see any hands. People are clapping. But God bless you. Anyone here? Let's raise your hand up. I. Anyone up in the balcony? Are you all clapping by faith? Because <laughs> I, I don't see any hand here. Up, up, up in the balcony? All right. Okay. I see one hand there. It's okay. God bless you. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. Anyone else, if you, if you did that, friend, I can't necessarily see every hand here. Uh, but on the, on the exits, there will be people waiting with these green bags. Uh, we'd like you to please go to them. They have a card, called, a white card called a decision card. Just give them your name and number, and they'll give you this bag. And they will make sure we call you from the church office to guide you how to use the resources available to you. Let's pray, and we'll dismiss. Father, we thank you. We can leave this morning knowing that we are righteous which we receive really as a gift. Help us to enjoy it. Help us to celebrate it. Help us to live free under your righteousness. Thank you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit continue with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Next Sunday. We'll do chapters 4 and 5. So read chapters 4 and 5 before you come. If you get a chance, you're welcome to go to the sermon notes on Saturday before you come. It'll just help us, you know, uh, do this uh, well. God bless you. Enjoy your Sunday. God bless. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.